his ignorance is basically made into conventional wisdom. And the difference is, earlier, we would have digested it. I guarantee you that today we will not digest it. Thanks. That's the big change. Sometimes, in terms of our mindset, we are still handicapped by what we inherited in the past. That India is on the cusp of a very major mindset change. In the British period, the narrative was being uh, uh, dominated by British historians whose only objective was to show the Indians in very poor light. Narrative continued, unfortunately, after independence, when an imported ideology became dominant in the historical narrative. An assumption that India is on the cusp of a very major mindset change. We are, of course, in the midst of very other, other physical changes which we see around us. But most important is this mindset change. That mindset change is basically characterized by a growing, an explosion of self-confidence. Now, some of that self-confidence is a bit uh, reckless, I do concede. But more than that, I think what everyone recognizes is that we are no longer willing to be patronized by different parts of the world. That's the most important aspect which is there. And part of that has got to do with, of course, the soaring economic growth which we've witnessed, part of it. But the larger question which we have is, is our intellectual development, our awareness of who we are, our self-identity as clear as the economic path which we've chosen out to be? And here I would say, sometimes, in terms of our mindset, we are still handicapped by what we inherited in the past. And we inherited two facets. We inherited a civilization, but we also inherited the legacy of colonialism. I think, uh, Sai calls it coloniality. I'm not so, um, I'm a bit old fashioned, so I just go by the old fashioned thing of colonialism. But the imperial mindset, and here this is uh, something which uh, Hiraman should take note. Hiraman is one of those few scholars who blends an awareness of modern intellectual thought along with the entire legacy of Sanskrit. At one time, this was fairly common. But from the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, we sort of thought that Sanskrit is something which is meant for the Pujaris. It ceased to be a sexy subject. It became something which was an optional extra, which was some, some drudge. And part of that drudge also became the attempt to make it into a conversational language, which it's not. The legacy which we have of a classical language was lost. And I think this affected our ability to understand our history. I think the, uh, the one of the uh, big problems which we face occasionally, even when we are studying ancient India, is that many of the languages in which the scripts are written no longer have enough scholars in this country who have an awareness of it. So, it, with the result, 
we are completely dependent on somebody else's version of it. At present, for example, I would tell you, there's a good friend of mine, a chap called William Dalrymple. He's written two very good books. The book, book on Afghanistan and a book on the, uh, uh, the, the last days of the revolt of 1857. He's now, taken, he's now put his hand to ancient India. And the results are quite comic. But that comedy is being digested uncritically by a lot of people. For instance, we are being told that Ashoka was half Greek. <laughs> I mean, if he was good, then he had to be half white. Nah? <laughs> we are told all sorts of, we are told that there is nothing to suggest that the Gupta age was anything remarkable, because he says there are no inscriptions. His ignorance is basically made into conventional wisdom. And the difference is, earlier, we would have digested it. I guarantee you that today we will not digest it. Thanks. That's the big change. Now, some, some of this may come about because in social media, we have some people who are extremely combative. We may, it may come about because on television here, two people on my left who actually shoot from the hip on a daily basis. And so that inhibition, that restraint, that understatement which mark people of my generation is probably not there. And I would say that that's a good thing. Because I think it's time we actually asserted ourselves. Gone are the days of extreme civility. I see Vivek here in front of me. And it's when he made his film Kashmir Files, a lot of people say, it's a bit over the top, isn't it? Look, we've had enough subtlety as far as Kashmir con is concerned, and it didn't register. So it was time when someone put it with a blunt <laughs> sledgehammer, because what happened there was not a tea party. I think I'll leave that for the yeah, moment. Thank I you so much. Chopanath, thank you. In the British period, the narrative was being uh, uh, dominated by British historians whose only objective was to show the Indians in very poor light as enfeebled people who had nothing going for them. That narrative continued, unfortunately, after independence when an imported ideology became dominant in the historical narrative. So if you look at the way history was taught in the colonial period and the way it was taught for some decades after independence, there's a remarkable similarity. India was not united, it was weak, it was divided, all that happened. But what I find very surprising is that in the post-independence period, we have consciously, deliberately not given space to native voices. There are so many evidences that we have of people speaking about the times in which they were living, and those voices do not figure in our narrative at all. And I'll just give you four literary uh, uh, sources which were there available at the time of independence, which have continued to be available, but which have not factored in any attempt at history writing post-independence. Uh, so I'll just take five more minutes. The first, the first uh, account is by a person who was a minister in Gujarat, one of the courts in Gujarat. He was an eyewitness to the invasions of Mahmud Ghaznavi. So he writes about the invasions. And then he says that Mahmud Ghaznavi, when he was on the way back, he saw another beautiful temple. He tried to dislodge the image and destroy the temple, but he failed. As a historian, I'm not concerned whether this was right or wrong, but for me, the importance of this work is that it is a first narrative of resistance of the medieval period. The, 
The second narrative is absolutely remarkable. This first narrative was written in 1024. The second narrative that I'm talking about was written in 1333. That was the time when the Sultanate was at its peak. And there is a person who was also a minister. He gave up his job and went to all parts of the country that he could, which had been devastated by the invasions. And everywhere he went, he told the people, and this is a very revolutionary idea that he made, he said, don't worry if the images are damaged. Khandit murtiyon ko bhi puja karu. Because in these times, Khandit murtis are as remarkable and as powerful as before. Today we take out Khandit murtis, we cannot think. But the most important uh, thing that Jin Prabhasuri is known for, his book is available, it has been translated. It is available for the last 50, 70 years. Now he talks, he says that uh, there was an image when Mohammed Ghori defeated Prithvira Chauhan, then a message went, keep the images hidden away. So this particular image was buried under sand and kept there for 150 years almost. At some point, that image comes to Delhi, to the treasure house of Mohammed bin Tughlaq. Now Jin Prabha Suri, he actually meets Mohammed bin Tughlaq and says that we want this image back. Mohammed bin Tughlaq asks for the image to be brought from his storehouse, looks at it and gives it to Jin Prabha Suri. And in 1334, Jin Prabha Suri is writing that I got the image, I reconsecrated it and built a small temple in Delhi and we are so happy and proud that we are able to resume worship over there. These are absolutely remarkable instances which should fe feature in our history. I'm not saying whether it's true or not, but these are important narratives of resistance. I want to mention two more from the South. One is a lady, she was the wife of the Crown Prince of Vijayanagar. She wrote a poem called Madurai Vijay. Madurai Vijay was controlled by the Muslim Sultanate. And in this, this only one copy has survived by chance and it is not complete. But in this poem, she says, Goddess Minakshi came to my husband in a dream and she said, look at what is happening around you. Kaveri is full of blood. In the Chidambaram temple, the Mridang has been replaced by the howls of jackals. And she narrates whatever she sees. And then she gives Prince Kamban the sword of dharma. And she says, get up, do your dharma duty, and restore the order, the natural order. And it is a historical fact that Prince Kamban opens up many temples that had been closed and some that had been converted into mosques. So this is also a narrative of resistance, whether it happens or not, but these are eyewitness accounts of people who wrote at the time when these incidents happened. The last that I want to mention is that uh, the Tirupati temple was under the control of the Sultan of Golconda for 150 years. So in that 150 years, I've been able to find only one native voice, that is, a person who writes a hundred verses long poem in Telugu, only 99 verses have survived, one has not. But those 99 verses, if you read them, they, you know, fill you with sorrow, empathy. They, he's telling uh, Tirupati, the god, that you know, you are so powerful and you're helpless. Thousands of people are storming into your temple every day. Why don't you do anything? So this story, of Tirupati, it does not end in triumph because we have to remember that mostly uh, the Hindu success story. I'll just take two minutes more. This is very irritating, you know. You call us, make us wait, and then say finish in five minutes. What is the point in calling us? It's uh, okay, telling me to be calm, I'm being calm. Okay, but I have to register my protest. Okay, now, so uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Tirupati poem, it does not see the triumph of the order or of dharma. It ends in anguish and defeat. And the last two points that I want to make is that when we talk about anguish and defeat, 
And we think that every time the Hindus succeeded, most often they did not. And I'll give you the example of the Mahamatya of the Sri Ranganath Temple. That Mahamatya records what happens when the Turkish armies come. First time, they're totally unaware they're defeated. In the second time, the processional murti is taken away by three priests of that temple, father, uncle, and son. And for 20 years, over 20 years, they live in the jungles. They eat from the jungle, two of them die. And when this young boy goes back to Ranganath, he is not allowed entry because nobody recognizes him. The young boy has become a wizened old man. And they say, we cannot allow you entry. They don't recognize the murti. He said, this is murti I ran away with. So the story of how this story unfolds, it's very, very sad and tragic. And last point, since there's a pressure of time, uh, in the 18th century, till the 18th century, no temple in North India survived. They had all been devastated. So in the 18th century, when temple building began, because the Mughal Empire was in decline, we think that the first temple was a temple, Kardameshwar Temple. So we think that is the first temple built in the 18th century. But when art historians saw that temple, they realized it is an assembled temple. It is not. That temple was built from the remains of so many temples that had been destroyed. And so if you see that temple, you'll see Khandit Murtis on the walls, uh, devastated Murtis, everything. But you know, uh, what I'm just saying is that all this narrative, it has to be remembered by us, because only when we remember the past can we move forward. And now India has taken a very big leap forward. People are becoming aware of this suppressed, forgotten history. They are getting joyous when they, when they see that past, and we see a new hope and available in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. is happening, happening constantly in history, and you have given four or five very important examples. But this narrative of resistance, which Sai Deepak just mentioned, in what way do we intensify intellectually also, particularly here we are concerned with intellectual resistance, uh, because the reparation is too weak a term now for us to use. How do we do it today, like you have been doing, and these two intellectuals are doing? Uh, resistance was always there right from the advent of the invaders. And it continued even uh, till the colonial rule and thereafter. What happened was that partition took place along religious lines. But unfortunately or fortunately, uh, many of the people who opted for, voted for partition opted to stay in India. So that was a problem that uh, left group of historians, they try to address that problem by negating that the previous 1,000 years and saying there was Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb and uh, the rulers were all the time trying to accommodate. But uh, how long can you go on fudging the past? I think now the time has come when people are refusing to accept all this that has been taught to them. And uh, people on the ground, they are taking things into their own hands they don't need uh, validation from anyone. They are doing what they think has to be done. Yeah, I, I would agree to some extent, but what Shai, Sai Deepak just said, that it is, it is those of us who read and, and interact uh, in public spheres and read in the books and newspapers are, of course, trying to reject in certain sense. And quite rightly, as Sai Deepak said, that no, if you want to fight this war on social media in a way that is being fought, perhaps it is futile. But there is still more. Resistance was always there, but how do we convert it into a path towards victory? I think uh, that resistance, the idea of that resistance was never lost among the common people. And that is there, and they are pushing the narrative forward. They don't need recommendations from people like us. Thank you. It's